Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We're going to be doing something totally different today, something that we have never done before, but first I have a quick little announcement. The map of the week is Corona. If you have not played a game on Corona yet, you need to go download that map or join the appropriate lobby and play one. If it's any good, send me the replay. On Saturday, we're going to be doing a live cast of the best Corona replay that I get sent, and then we'll all be playing a game, four versus four, first come, first serve, and we're going to have a blast for that Saturday live cast. Do not miss it. 6 p.m. Eastern United States time, and that is the end of my plug. So, what we're going to do today is basically go through the overflow of my replay folder. Um, I get sent tons and tons of replays, and a lot of them have maybe five minutes worth of epicness hid inside 40 minutes of grinding or unwatchable stupidity or, you know, all this other stuff. There's a lot of cool moments that get passed up because the rest of the game really isn't watchable. So today, I just picked out three random ones, ones that people have sent me over the course of the last couple of weeks, and there's little bits and pieces here and there that are either face palmy or hilarious, whatever it may be. We're going to watch these sometimes at plus 10, a lot of times at plus 5. Things will be missed if you're looking for a technical cast. This is not one, but I am just going to ramble about maybe it will matter, maybe it won't, and we're just going to wait until funny things happen. The first one is going to be on Seraphim Glaciers. This is between the Red Viper and a Kitte. It's the first time a kitten has been featured in one of our casts. Unfortunately, it is not the adorable cute kind of kitten. It would be the Cybern variety, which tends to be on fire and stealthed. So, yeah, not one that you really particularly want to mess with. The map is Seraphim Glaciers, which could potentially be a map in the coming weeks for the live cast. Um, we've got 2v2v2v2, v2 v2 v2, or a 4 versus 4 north, south, or east, west. The map is pretty symmetrical in most directions, so yeah. It makes for a variety of different ways that you can play it. It is fairly large, so you're going to see lots of drops, and we do see that going on right here. We've got a Q drop, one engineer on the southern end of the island, one engineer on the north, and the last group dropped in the center, which actually has a lot of mass extractors. You definitely want to claim that if at all possible. T1 bomber headed up to the north, which is promptly going to get shot down before it can kill anything at all. So a total waste of a T1 bomber, and the three engineers are going to get set down, but are going to go hydro first. Was the Red Viper critical on power? Yes, he was, so I guess we can't really fault him on that, but hydro first is typically a bad idea because this. Three engineers versus three engineers. These guys are going to go point defense. Point defense coming online before a single unit can drop out of the factory. Mech Marine promptly gets shot in the face, and that factory is going to go down, but the three engineers are going to retreat. Hopefully lay down some more land factories in the back. Let's just take a peek here. Roughly symmetrical expansions all the way around. So we're going to see actually very even warfare between these guys. Two engineers remaining. They are going to lay down factories. And unusually enough, no combat units out. More engineers. More factories. More point defense. Looks like this is going to be full scale warfare. Even though it is a teeny tiny little piece of ground. Speaking of ground. If these are islands, are these continents... I don't really know. Judging by, yeah, yeah, no, let's not. Even if you're going by subcom standards, still not that big of a place. That is going to be actually very, very tight. We have two engineers in the back laying down more land factories. It is four factories versus three. So simply on build power, these guys are going to win. Frigate coming around the back could potentially pop off those engineers, but it's not. If these were out front, it would be going much better for the Red Viper, but he's kind of in chillax mode, not really microwing his units, not doing anything productive, and it looks like Kite is doing his absolute best to out-micro him. So, yeah, strictly on the merit of lax play, Kite is going to demolish that expansion with an equal amount of investment. So, center is going to go to Kite, and that's going to put him ahead, at least for now. Other than that, the map looks split roughly 50-50, but those eight mass extractors are going to make a tremendous difference. We've got a lot of navy coming online for both players. Frigates everywhere, as is typically the case on Seraphim Glaciers and Roanoke Abyss. 
they kind of tend to play in a similar manner, but lots more naval factories going down for Kite. Red Viper is ahead in Eco, though. Maybe he will be able to get enough build power online to make use of that. Obviously, the Cybern player is going to have the stronger frigate, so he will be able to get more done, but yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. The real question here is whether or not this game is going to clear T2 into T3 Navy, and whether or not UEF can get enough in the water to sustain itself versus the Cybern T2, which is ridiculously powerful. Whole lot of T1 tanks dropped, one transport full, actually not even completely full, looks like five tanks were there, but that's kind of a waste. Only a T2 Master Extractor killed, the T2 ACU is immediately going to rebuild that, and yeah, that was pretty much a moot point. Jester's moving over to the left, Frigate's to the right, and it looks like the map control is slipping for Red Viper, but Red Viper is an eco whore at heart, just like the best of us. Looks like he is pulling in more eco from less ground control which is typically a sign of an inferior number of combat units, as we can see in the center here. Nowhere near the same amount of air and much, much less navy. I think this is going to come back to bite him in the buttocks. He is scaling up rather aggressively, already capping his mass extractors. He is teching up on his side island as well. 172 mass income to 113 but this is where the rubber hits the road and i don't think red viper is going to be able to pull out of this the torp bomber came in and immediately got snuffed out yay for frigate anti-air but there's a whole mess of t1 subs there and no coopers for red viper so his navy is basically going to be obliterated from the face of planet earth more torpedo bombers streaming in Kite is riding on empty with a lot of his interceptor force, but even just his active force is more than enough to overpower Red Viper's limited number of interceptors. Yet more torpedo bombers coming in. That is the 5th or 6th, if I'm not mistaken, with the rounded up to 10th coming in. And yeah, that is going to be the end of the naval production down there. There is a factory going down here, though, and that is immediately going to start on Tech 2, so maybe there is a recovery in sight. Red Viper is sitting on nearly double the mass income of Kite, but this is the point where you have to ask yourself, is the eco worth it? Because if you don't have any build power to implement it, well, then you're stuck. You might as well not have the mass. Red Viper is not going to overflow, though, because he is a good person and does not want to crush the soul of a commentator. So we're going to see some T2 engineers coming out from Kite to try to snatch up, I imagine, this mass field in the south. I was about to say good luck with that because frigates will clean up the engineers rather quickly, but there's no frigates. There's no naval presence. There's not even any point defense over there. So yeah, drop to your heart's content. You will get all of that mass. Through the fury of T1 torpedo defense spam, this is temporarily safe, but now Salem's are chewing through the southern tip of the island. Something is going to have to be done to deal with that, and then this is just a huge finagle. Uh, you definitely don't want to be in the position where you have a substantial chunk of navy sitting off your shore, and here comes some more T2 drops. Lots and lots of Mantis, and there are no combat units whatsoever on this island. This is about to get nasty. Medusa's coming in, stunning mass extractors, although I don't think they actually stop production even when they get stunned. It is a little bit more damage than the Mantis can muster, and it does help range the T1 point defense, but uh, Medusa's are not the best base wreckers. Not in the slightest. Point defense going down all over the place. That's going to help quite well versus all of these T1 units. I am not sure if quite well is a modifier that belongs with the term helpful, but we're just going to lay it down there anyway and let it lie. There we go. T1 bombers on the case. Salem's working around the northern tip of the island. And maybe we will... Nope. Going to pull back yet again. So many T2 units. We got three Salem's over to the right. Nice little aggressive drop from the Red Viper, unfortunately within reach of a T1 point defense, which is probably going to kill every single tank for a whopping 
total of 10 until it apparently loses radar coverage and stops firing. That's impossible though, because there is a mechs right there. What kind of glitch was that? Fail of a point defense, if you ask me. Salem's coming in to chew out the mass extractor points over there. And yet more income disappearing from the Red Viper's wallet as those mass extractors go down. 252 to 240 income, though. Red Viper is still ahead in mass income. How does he manage that? He probably, yes, he does. Two T3 mass extractors right over there. So he's actually scaling to capped T3 mechs while he is utterly floundering in disaster Navy-wise. Here comes the T3 UEF. Will this be his salvation? There are actually strat bombers on the field. Holy smokes, this is bad. No ASF for the Red Viper. The strats mean that he is going to have to sink mass into cruisers. Thank goodness for UEF shields because that's the only thing that is going to save him from this. And more Medusas being dropped on the island, clearing out the north tip once again. This is the T1 anti-air spam that you have to use to kill strat bombers if you are not already sitting on T3 tech. Um, it's something that a lot of people uh, pass over. Flak is actually not the best thing for one or two strat bombers. It's good for groups of strat bombers, but it's not good for single or maybe a pair. You need to build a T1 anti-air because it can fairly reliably hit strat bombers with a decent amount of DPS. Plus, it can be built very quickly in swarms. So, well, I guess stationary units don't exactly swarm. It can be built quickly by swarms of T1 engineers. So, it, it does make a fairly effective strat bomber counter if you have nothing else. Tons of mass extractors going offline for the Red Viper. Those strat bombers hurt. His eco being chewed to shreds. He's now down to a third of Kite's income. This is very, very bad. Power going down. He's still got more than Kite, though. 8.3k, relatively well balanced. He is slurping up some reclaim from somewhere, and there's the mass stall. But now he's ticking up once again. Hopefully he can get, yes, engineers down into that beautiful chunk of naval reclaim. That is exactly what he needs to keep him in the game. 47k and ticking versus 27k for Kite. But look at this. Look at this. That gap is going to close very, very quickly as all of this glorious mass is slurped up by the white engineers. This is not looking good for Red Viper at all. Not at all. He is now sitting on less than 25% map control. There's a lot of strat bombers online that Kide can use to pound his base. And I don't really see a whole lot going for him other than, oh look, a nuke sub. Does he actually have, nope, he's mass stalling. <clears throat> well, he's going to have to stop production of something to get that nuke to finish. Because otherwise, that is going to take an eternity to build. I don't know why Mastal disproportionately affects. Actually, I do, but whatever. Um, the point is, Mastal disproportionately affects TMLs and strat launchers. So if you're Mastalling at all, they will take exponentially more time to load, which is a royal pain in the left buttock. All right, strat bombers hovering offshore. Will they actually do anything? I do like the battle cruiser spam. There are three battle cruisers online. Unfortunately, Cyber Navy also has T3, and we have three, six battleships with number seven on the way and eight shortly following that. Typically, UEF can beat Cybern with only battle cruisers, which sounds really weird, but battle cruisers are significantly faster than battleships. And when you throw the bulwarks in for extra health, then good things come your way. But uh, when you have that many strat bombers pounding away at your navy, you already have an inferior number of units. You only have one battleship versus seven. Yeah, it's not gonna go very well, but we have on our hands a sneaky sneaky bastard this guy is running up to the north strategic launch right on the head of the acu and he turns around and walks directly into it 
for a win for the Red Viper. That is just about the face palmiest win condition that you can possibly have. You have someone that one navy, one map control, one air control was literally dropping everywhere, reclaiming the entire map for all of the eco to grind his opponent into a pulp and a strat sub snakes through. Story of my life. All right, there's the first game. Hopefully that was mildly entertaining at least. I am going to jump directly into another one without even breaking the cast. Let's go for this one over here. Now, this is a Black Ops Total Veterancy game, which takes place on one of the, uh, sh let, let's go with strangest as a descriptor, maps that I have ever seen. And uh, why are you downloading this large file when I just used you? I just loaded in this replay to make sure that there wasn't a desync. Oh well. Here we go. All right. So anyway, Black Ops and Total Veterancy, which means that you don't actually have to build power generators because you can simply vet up your commander by building things and your power income exponentially scales with the amount of veterancy on your commander. Hilarity is always guaranteed to ensue because every single statistic of every single unit increases the longer that it exists and does things. So your ACU gains veterancy by building, by combat, whatever. Your eco buildings scale up their production by vetting just by building things. Your factories increase in build power by vetting. Even units, I, I believe only your ACU, but even that scales up with speed. Your walking speed increases. There we go. Wrap your tongue around it, Brink. So let's go ahead and watch and see what these guys do with it. Obviously, we have kind of a pro and noob setup. Maybe not a pro. Average Joe and noob setup. We have a 1100 and 800 versus a 100 and 200. So not that that really makes a difference because when you're playing in modded games, you never know because all of these are unranked. So you could come across someone who has zero ranking or even minus 100 who all he plays is this specific mod and he just whips the tar out of you because you don't have enough experience. But uh, anyway, we will just have to see what happens. T1 Bombers out in front. Looks like we do have some air scouts, but no actual interceptors from the left-hand team. T1 Mobile Anti-Air out, which is typically a good idea, but when you have two bombers that are just going to eliminate it, it does not work out so very well for you. Critical mistake actually made by the left side with walking the ACUs. As I mentioned before, you need to scale up your commander. We're already at nine minutes here. And we've got T2 on this side with heavily vetted commanders, 78 mass income. Holy crap for Not Crazy Carl. Even more for Hans Werner, 101. Still scaling up his eco with his commander. Yeah, crazy things happening on the right. T1 Bombers trying to do a little bit of work, but there's a lot of stationary anti-air over there, so really not doing anything of note. But there are some T2 Bombers coming in. Unfortunately, they are being tailed pretty dang hard by some Interceptors. Going to get wiped out, but not before they eliminate basically the entire eco for Mass Tech. These guys are now turtling up in the middle. I like this map. Not really. This is the choke pointiest map that I have ever seen in my entire life. There's a choke point literally in the spawn there is a second choke point and a third then the middle which is two choke points and then symmetrical on the other side of the map and there's t3 air 15 minutes from not crazy carl um yeah so these guys are progressing not even to the halfway point on the map throwing down all the anti-air that they can possibly get their uh, little mitts on and then they are building tack defense just classic turtle tactics I don't know what they're planning to do with those turtle tactics when obviously their opponents are going massively for air, but to each his own. This map is 40 kilometers by 5, which is one of the strangest map dimensions that I have ever seen in my life. It's like playing Supcom on a Tetris piece is basically what this boils down to. 
Although I guess if you count the square Tetris piece, then every subcom game is like that. But let's not delve too deep into this analogy because inevitably they all fall apart. So Hans Werner is on T3 all the way around, land and air. I imagine if it was Navy, it would be that way as well. And here we have another whaler coming out. Is that a whaler? Nope. Yep. Wait a minute. Oh, it's Black Ops. I forgot. Sorry, folks. That means that Seraphim, of course, has a T3 gunship because Black Ops. For those of you who don't know, Black Ops has a lot of units added. Several experimentals, several T3s for each faction, even some T1 and T2, although not quite as many. And that Strat Bomber is now laying waste to Inkheart's base. Now, what's going to be hilarious about this is that, ah, uh, yeah, 8 veterancy already with 26 kills. That thing is going to vet infinitely as long as it keeps killing stuff, and killing stuff it shall continue to do. The other funny thing is that the damage will keep increasing the longer it keeps killing stuff. So we're going to start seeing factories and such things dropped by horrendous amounts of HP in one pass, and it's still killing things. 47 with 10,000 health available on that strat bomber. Stupid, stupid things. That strat slipped through the anti-air shield, which is why you don't build all of your anti-air in one spot. And I did see that Inkheart had past tense an ASF or two, but uh, in all in all, not the ideal response to the strap bomber coming out. Although, really, what can you do? And this is fun. We've got a drop tons of T2 tanks. Hello, Mr. Pillar. Not sure what the Ravagers are for, although actually with the red ACU out there, if he doesn't run fairly soon, those Ravagers could potentially do terrible, terrible things to his commander, except that the map is bigger than I think it is, and they're not actually in range. Still going on that Strat Bomber. Ah, stay zoomed out, Brink. Let me slow down. Ugh. I can't see how many kills it has because it's moving too quickly. We've got 83 freaking kills on that Strat Bomber, and I do believe Mass Tech is doomed. Doomed, I say. Because obviously no commander could possibly survive against that many T2 units. Although he is going to take out two-thirds of them with his death nuke. Yay for sacrificial play. Strat Bomber's coming in for Not Crazy Carl. Not that he really needed any more because he does have the single most hero Strat Bomber that I have seen in recent memory. 91 kills right there. T3 gunships biting into Eaton Cart's commander. Fortunately, he does have a few shields and some T3 mobile anti-air. So this is going to get beaten back quite nicely. Pillar's now flowing in. Normally, this would be a good defense. You've got point defense all the way across the gap. You're using your choke point well because you're bottling up units inside it. But you know what? When there's that many units, it doesn't matter how many point defense you build. They will be overrun. At this point, basically, Inkheart is playing survival, closing in on the commander. And the only problem with having that many tanks is that you literally cannot get all of them close enough to actually damage the target at once. Inkheart is down. And that is the kind of thing that happens when you watch modded games. Typically, you'll have one person or one team that has a lot of experience with the mod, and then they end up pulling off something just stupid, like a Strat Bomber with 91 kills, about to be 92, 22 veterancy with 12,000 health available, still sitting at 50% HP, even after taking all of that damage. It just gets completely and totally out of control, which is one of the reasons that I love total veterancy, because I like things that get completely and totally out of control, but maybe that's just me. All right, we're going to close out this game and go for the last one, which is actually a little bit more normal of a replay. This is going to be on Canis. It is a four versus four edition, and it's got some familiar players in it. But the naming or the nomenclature, I should say, is kind of odd. And this game made me facepalm so very, very hard that I was not sure what to do with myself. On the north side, we have Dermudkaflux, whose name has been degrading gradually ever since I saw him on Forge Alliance. He was originally the Modka Fox, which kind of changed to Lemudka Fox. 
and now apparently has even lost that semblance of a clear translation because we're now in, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, he is up there. We've got K240 in the air slot, Michelle Yeoh on front taking Seraphim, Modka Fox is Aeon, and then the saddest panda in the world has joined us for a game as Cybert. Is that no UEF? Okay, double Aeon. Then on the back side, we have Icy Nightmare taking his customary UEF, Bulletproof Bob taking Aeon on the front, Gorton, hey, have not seen him in a game in a long time, actually. Um, he is going Aeon and then Cybern for the Avenger, the single solitary lone Avenger. I do not think that he can call in his teammates into a game that has already launched, but whatever. Maybe he will be able to hold his own. All right, T1 Bomber coming down from the north. Michelio is going to throw that thing out front, immediately knocking down an Engineer. Two more. Three. Two more. Hero Bomber. It looks like he's even going to grab one out on this expansion. He's already up to six kills just out of spite, hurling a bomb to the side at Icy's commander and then going to miss the firing cycle on that T1 bomber. Oh, sad, sad day when the streak was broken. However, he is going to pick up that engineer on the rebound. Second bomber coming out. Maybe it will be as successful as the first, but I kind of doubt it. Already pulling seven kills on that sucker, and if he gets those two engineers, he may get up to ten. Here comes the anti-air, and no, all of his dreams are dashed. I really wish that that group of engineers would have been killed, but that's okay. He's still going to pick up eight kills on that second group of engineers. So kudos to Michelio for epic bombers, because he got a combined 16 kills off of those, if my math is correct, but I can't math, so don't take my word for it. And yeah, I'm sure you'll see a correction for that in the comments because I probably slipped up. Saddest Panda going around the left side. We've got K240 actually outside of his base, which is somewhat of an abnormality, to be honest. I have played with him quite a few times and he is a professional snicker gap player. Um, it's it's going to be interesting to see what his air game does because I have no doubt that he can eco with the best of them, but I have my... Um, I have different thoughts and feelings about his ability to use units. Let's just leave it at that. Um, let's see, on the south side, Icy Nightmare scaling up his eco quite nicely, taking advantage of the extra income from the left side expansion to push his mass income up to 41 plus reclaim, which is right there with the best of them. Looks like 48 for the Monka Fox and hanging around in that zone with pretty much everybody else. So it looks like 50 per tick-ish, 45 for Icy Nightmare at the moment. All right, we've already got attack comm. It is inevitable. It is a normal thing. You always see a attack commander on Canis, and here it is nine minutes in, hurling an absurd amount of projectiles towards the southern team. Obviously, TMD is going to be built ASAP, but it is impossible not to lose some mass extractors when that thing comes online. T2 mechs flicking out of existence left and right. 12 kills on that commander, and the majority of them are hapless mass extractors that got on the wrong side of fate. Long distance shot, and nothing but net taking out that T2 mechs. Unfortunately, that's going to be a wasted one because buzz kill, that's why. I do love the fact that the Seraphim tack has been brought in line with the strength of the UEF tech. It is not necessarily as overpowered as it once was. It is still, however, a horrendously devastating weapon if you are not prepared for it. Entirely hoplites on the left side. I count two rhinos and lots of hops. Wow. Tongue stuck in my throat quite literally that time. Um... Yeah, as long as he can kite with those, he will be okay. Steady stream of T1 units coming through, which are basically one-shot KO'd when the hoplite opens fire. So not a bad setup, if I do say so myself. And it looks like that is going to be the end of hyper-aggression. Now we've got our lane set up. We've got walls going down for Michelio. Actually, lots and lots and lots of walls. Holy cow, three layers across the landmass, not that that's going to do you a whole lot of good when you have an opponent that has mostly hover units, but whatever. That is one of the glories of Aeon. You can't build walls over water. Maybe that's a unit that someone needs to add 
in a mod. Of course, I guess terraforming would kind of count as that. But yeah, Aeon can exploit some areas of the map that you really wouldn't think of walling off. This is not going to do you much good. Hopwhite's kind of sort of kiting around, but taking a few more hits than is absolutely necessary, and that was nearly a friendly fire kill from that T1 artillery. Thankfully, the Hoplite dodged out of the way just in time, whether it was intentional or not. The Viper spam is real, always with Cybern, with the Vipers. Thankfully, it is going to knock out any point defense in the area and lay down some fire on that factory as well. I'm just glad those missiles don't track because if they did, that would be the most horrendously overpowered weapon in the history of Supreme Commander. Everyone would go Tech 2, Cybern, and spam absolutely nothing but Vipers because no one would ever need anything else. Hey, why not add an anti-air toggle while we're at it? Maybe even eliminate the entire unit selection for Cybern. They build a T1 factory, you can build Vipers from it, and no other units are available to you for the entirety of the game. Loyalists, moving down towards the south. Actually, that would be kind of hysterical, because you could pair Vipers with Loyalists, and it would be TML and TMD um, in the same spot. Harbingers moving to intercept. Luckily, they're moving around, so they're not taking any missile fire. Missile fire is going after the point defense instead. But they are going to dodge and weave, dodge and weave, and successfully take out those Loyalists. More Harbingers moving up from the back. All they have to do is run in and kill that crap, and it will be over. Observation, there are a lot, and I do mean a lot, of ASF online, which means that uh, K240 has had completely uncontested T3 air for an extended period of time. Probably four or five minutes at this point. He has no Strat Bombers. Why are there no strap bombers? Lots of tack missiles on the right-hand side, and they were aimed at the Monkey Lord and not the ACU, which is actually a good thing because the ACU did see it coming and moved out of the way. So, no tack snipe for you today, my good sir, but Monkey Lord is going to be heavily damaged and not come up for some time because of that. Now, there's four strap bombers online. It is late, though. 20 minutes. He could have had him a long time ago. We have an exposed ACU. Not going to be in one pass. But I think Avenger is dead. You cannot save him with your horrendous lack of T3 air. Strat Bombers unfortunately going down due to vast hordes of T2 mobile flak. But now there is a spider wreck. There is no more threat on the right hand side. And now it looks like the southern team is going to be left in peace. Because no one likes to press an advantage when you have it. Lots of T1 engineers dropping. Amazingly, there's no point defense, and it looks like we're going to get a T1 point defense online at the same time as a T2 comes online. Who's going to win this? I think blue, actually. Reclaiming the T2 engine. Oh! What? 39 health. Ah! How does that happen? That is, that is brutal. Hero T1 Engineers, well done, Modka Fox. Monkey Lord moving down with a tremendous battalion of Loyalists as bodyguards, going toe to toe with all of the Harbingers that Bulletproof Bob can muster, and I don't think that they will be enough. I do believe that the South Side is officially doomed at this point, unless something incredibly dumb happens. But yeah, this is the craziness that is Canis that is kind of one side gameplay. K240 is still, I mean, he's sitting in complete and total air domination, not even air control, air domination. And he is not building combat units. There's two strats out, three strats out, not really been doing anything too incredibly impressive. Hey ho, there are some SACUs. Diving in directly in range of the Harbingers. One of them is probably going to die, but no, they're going to escape towards the water. Galactic Colossus coming in to save the day. He is going to drive those Harbingers back into the base where they belong. And now there is... What? I think that was damaged. Okay, that would actually explain it. Okay, one disadvantage of fast-forwarding. Sometimes you miss stuff. Anyway... The South team is basically building T4s, hoping to all hell that they do not die immediately. And there's an Awasa. It's overkill like swatting a gnat with a sledgehammer. Here it comes. The base isn't even well shielded. 
immediately dropping 69 kills <laughs> on that Awasa, picking up three more with the ASF kills to knock that into discombobulation. Bomber going to drop again, wiping out large swaths of the base. Any hope that Gorton could have mustered is going to fly away with that loss of mechs and build power. He just got knocked down to 168 mass income, which is not enough to do much of anything at this point in the game. And that Awasa has dropped. Now, there is some reclaim from that Awasa. Theoretically, they could get a couple of T4 online. But where is K240? Ah, finally. Finally, a shift to Strat Bombers. We may see the end of this game yet. It may not drag out to infinity like I was beginning to think it would. Well, hello, chicken bot. There's a fat boy moving out, fronted by a Galactic Colossus, which is honestly about the best duo in subcom. You've got the most well-balanced direct fire experimental with the heaviest support unit in the entire game, possibly the only T4 that is actually worth its mass, and not just advantageous because of its low build time. T2 artillery going down in a tremendous rush. That is actually one of the only things that can counter a fat boy directly. And it is not actually aiming at the fat boy, so fail. There is a megalith and a chicken, though, so I don't think these guys should be worried at all. Even a galactic colossus. Three T4s across the front. Not much that the south side will be able to do to push against that massive swarm of T1 scouts moving across. Oh, look. A Soul Ripper chewing its way. Om nom 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 nom. I like ET1 point defense. And run away. Because, of course, you do. I really hope that that Soul Ripper doesn't go down because, ah, yes, good, assistance. That would be highly embarrassing. It's actually possible for like 20 ASF to kill a Soul Ripper, which is hilarious. And it does take a little while to do, but yeah, the anti-air is basically non-existent on the Soul Ripper. It cannot, it literally cannot defend itself. Here comes the second Awasa. Maybe this one will have as good a luck as the first one. Really, I don't see a whole lot more shielding. This right here, a single bomb right there. That's all it needs. It will pay for itself in mass cost in one pass if it just drops a bomb on all of those power generators, mass extractors, engineers, and various and sundry other things that are incredibly valuable. Gorton down to 2,500 HP. Not going to catch that bomb to the face, but he is so low on health. Here comes the Awasa for the second pass. Nope. A little bit of hover. A little bit of... Little bit of, but, uh, that's all, folks. A little bit of manipulation. And swinging wide, trying to come in for another pass. Sometimes the firing sequence on the Awasa gets entirely out of hand. There's the bomb on the beautiful area that I described before, bumping it up to 95 kills, but only one veterancy. That is sad. Oh, so sad. Sam's going to drop that thing down before another bomb can go off. Not... Uh, if he hadn't dropped all the mass directly in reach of Gordon, I would have said that that was totally worth it for the damage caused. It did knock Gordon's power income down quite a peg or two. But I don't think that Awasa was handled as well as it could have been. Here come the strats. Maybe Gordon will die this time. Under a freshly upgraded shield from Icy Nightmare. Wandering very close to outside the shield, but not actually there. All those strap bombers going to go down, and that is that. Fat boy chewing its way through the middle, but hey, look. Two Galactic Colossus versus Loyalists and Galactic Colossus and Chickens and SACUs and Megalus. Oh my! Even a Soul Ripper coming in for the action. This is just blatant disregard for unit safety. There is no contest here. This is a thorough beating down of a base. Fat Boy retreating. Icy Nightmare does have the commander's shield, but in the face of multiple experimentals, there is no way in hell that he is going to go in for an overcharge. Instead, he is going to run away. Run away. I don't think there's much space to run to, though. Throwing out the GG. I think he is correct. There goes Gorton melting in under the direct fire of two Galactic Colossuses is, is, is once, and Icy Nightmare is also down. That is going to be GG, folks. 
Probably one of the most steamrolly canises I have ever seen. That was utter and complete domination from the beginning to the end, but there were so many derps. Like, that game should have been won at 20 minutes because one player or one team had T3 air and the other team didn't. And everything was in favor of the North side and they took twice as long to win as they should have. Ah, uh, uh. My forehead hurts from the face desking, and I think I'm going to call it the end on this utter catastrophe of what I'm hoping can be still technically qualified as a cast. Okay, guys, that's going to clear out three of the many games that I have sitting that I just really haven't casted. If you actually like this format, let me know. I may actually be up to doing this once every couple of weeks or so. I don't know. It still kind of hurts my brain because it just it just does. If you don't understand why, I can't help you understand. But anyway, I'm going to wrap that up here. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully, you're enjoying all of the content that's coming to the channel. I have been having so much fun bringing all of this to you guys. It is a blast, and I greatly appreciate your support. I will see you guys in the next video.